you don't need a financial center that has five times G its GDP of, managed, of pieces of paper sl sloshing around, doing nothing productive. Uh, France, which is not in a great state of health either, uh, has a much, much, much smaller financial sector and average productivity is higher than, 25% mm. higher than, than Britain, and income per person is higher than Britain. So you, yeah, you don't need it. The, the financing of the Green New Deal re will require uh, tax and wealth, ending tax havens and so on, but it, that will really not be at all enough. Mm -hmm. Even if you introduce a wealth tax, like the one that Elizabeth Warren and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez are proposing in the United States, all you'll be able to raise is about 1% of GDP. It's good, it's good, but it's not enough. We need 5, 6, 7% to have the green transition, and the creation of the good quality jobs that we need in this country, in Europe, and so on. The main way of energizing this excess liquidity is what I referred to before. Public investment banks that issue bonds that operate like sponges that soak up the liquidity from the real estate market, from uh, the uh, share buyback process, which is boosting share prices without any investment, without any quali good quality jobs, uh, and the central banks just announcing to the market so they will support the bonds issued by the public investment banks. That was the New Deal idea originally of Franklin Roosevelt. Yep. It's how he managed to prevent the perpetuation of the Great Depression in the United States, that, that basic pi public finance idea. But beyond that, we need to reconsider the model of capitalism that we have. Because you know, think about it. Every time you, you use an app to buy a train ticket in this country, right? You know that 75p goes to train line. Uh, train line belongs to KKR. You've never heard of KKR. KKR owns Boots, the chemists. Did you know that? Did you know that behind the, the majority of the corporations and big banks like JP Morgan in the United States, Bank of America, uh, US Bank, uh, Walmart, and so on, there are three companies that you probably have never heard of. Uh, BlackRock, Vanguard, uh, State Street, have you heard of them? They own 70% of capitalism, mm. right? And your little 75p every time you buy uh, a train line ticket, yeah, sort of slashes around through there. So you have a situation where the railway, railway system in, in Britain is siphoning anything between 170 and 200 million through the apps that you use to buy a train ticket, and that finds itself into the KKR tax havens of the Cayman Islands and so on and so forth. Now that effectively is a, think of it as a system of extracting value from the real economy and siphoning it off to create this, you know, the, the super, super, super reach of 0.1%. As long as we keep doing this, there will be no Green New Deal because those people, will always own the media, will always own Facebook, or be able to, you know, to buy as many, as many uh, you know, sponsored ads on Facebook to poison politics and to poison democracy. Unless we combine public financial tools that go back to have their roots in the, the New Deal of Roosevelt with a challenge to the property rights over apps, over Facebook, over railway systems, uh, we are not going to be able to save the planet and create jobs that stop people from feeling so angry that they vote for Johnson and Farage. Another, another thing to add to the train line story is that train line is owned by a nested series of 26 companies. So Trainline is owned by another company called Trainline HG, which is owned by another company called HG Holdings, so on and so on. There are 26 of these in a row. And why do, why do companies do that, do you think? It's so that they can never be identified. The, where the wealth is can never be pinned down, so they can never be taxed. That's right. Is the solution to that global, national? Is that for a government to tackle? Is it for governments to tackle? Is it going back to organisations like, dare I say it, the G20, which are unwieldy, unlikely to make a big decision? It's all of that. 
we have to act local, regional, you know, in our neighborhoods, everything. But it's but I you know, it's a good start is to renationalize re re the railways. Yeah. Uh, and have an app that belongs to the national railway company. Yeah, it's a good start. Can I say? Another very good start would be to acknowledge the idea of the commons, that there are things that we share, there are things that should not be privatizable. We used to accept that until uh, Thatcher, really, who came along with there's no such thing as society, following in Anne Rand's footsteps of altruism is evil, if you remember these two great statements of the 20th century. But th those, two, those two ideas were really the the basis upon which we dissolve the notion of the commons. The commons is not only to do with pieces of land. We, we know of that kind of commons where your sheep can graze, but it's to do with intellectual property. It's to do with a commons of knowledge. It's to do with shared resources. Um, shared resources being not only physical things. So we have to start thinking of, of the flow of energy and, and wealth in a, in a country in a nation as something that we have common interest in. It can't be just hived off and nested in 26, a series of 26 companies and end up in Arkansas or wherever, where are KKR? Somewhere like that, aren't they? Oh uh, yeah, uh, but you know, what is interesting about KKR is they control 200 companies and have four and a half thousand companies registered in the Cayman Islands through which they control those 200 companies. Uh -huh. And did you know that there's, there's an address in Harley Street, number 29 Harley Street, which has 15,000 company headquarters at it? And if you call them, somebody will answer the phone and she'll say, yeah, I, uh, sorry, Dave, I can't connect you with them. But it's, it's a completely fake address, but it's a, because England is now the, the money laundering capital of the world, it really is, actually. We, we are the real criminals in this. Um, that's what happens. You get 15,000... You know, this so is not called. collective guilt, because no, the, the not, majority of the British people are the victims of the City of London. Yeah. There's so much to unpick there, and I know I'm not going to be able to unpick it all. Um, I'm going to pick one small part, though. Do either of you accept, though, that profit and making money is a force for creativity? It's not the primary force, I don't think. I don't know anybody who is excited about what they make because it's going to make them money. I know people who are excited about what they make and who would like to make money from it and are happy when they do. But I don't, I've never met anybody, in my business anyway, for whom that's the primary motive. Happiness stems from creativity, from doing something creative, something worthy. And if you get some money for that as well, then you're the happiest person on earth. Mm. The trouble is that the connection between getting out of poverty and hard work has been broken, and the connection between doing something creative and making lots of money has been broken. This is the problem with capitalism. But allow me to just give, just give, give you a, a little hint of how that be has become a systemic failure. You know, Karl Marx was talking about the, the class struggle in Manchester, how, you know, the capitalist is investing in a machine, um, uh, the, the worker has no alternative to work there, and the value of the labor power is lower than the value of the product, you know. But now we've, we've really moved to a science fiction version of this. Think about it. Imagine you're the CEO of a large company, let's not mention one. You are beholden to the expectations of these KKRs and Black Rocks because they own the companies that own the companies that, they, that own your shares. Okay? So whether you're going to get a bonus or whether you're going to be reappointed depends on those people. Okay? Pension funds, yeah, equity firms, private equity capital and so on. Uh, the workers contribute as part of their you know, pay as they earn to a pension fund. The pension fund then is owned or owns the company that effectively drives the CEO. The CEO, any CEO, if, if a CEO today wants to make a little bit more money, do you know what he has to do? It's usually he. 
You know what he has to do? Just announce that he's firing 30% of the workforce. It doesn't really matter whether it, this will reduce profits, increase profits, whether it makes financial sense, huh? whether it's from an accounting perspective the right thing to do. Any CEO who announces a cull of the workforce will immediately get money. Why? Because the stock exchange immediately reacts to news of um, you know, redundancies reduced, reduced by boosting overheads. the price of the shares. A boost in the price of the shares always transmits into a boost of the bonuses of the CEO. So the, think about this. This is, this is, this is a, a, an evil plan, really. I mean, it's a very clever plan, but it, nobody planned it. It's something that evolved spontaneously within monopoly capitalism. The worker pays part of his wage into a pension fund which then demands of the CEO that the worker is fired so that the share goes up. Huh? Beautiful, isn't it? It's a circle. Um, I want to, just a couple of things before we open it up to everybody here who've been busy washing glasses. You, you haven't noticed they were there. Uh, one is this idea of the worker, of capital, linking back through, we talked about climate change. I wonder whether you think a lot of this could be made redundant, first, by the changes that climate change may bring, and secondly, by AI. Uh, people are talking about thousands of, ten, hundreds of thousands of people losing their jobs, white-collar jobs, blue-collar jobs, because of AI, the driverless car, the law firm that can you know, look at contracts simply by putting them through a computer. The sort of the, the, the joining of those two events, how dangerous is that? Are we even thinking about how they might interact? Some people are. There's a very interesting new book by Stuart Russell just came out, which is about the more dystopian possibilities of, of AI. Um, I, I can't remember the, t the name at the moment, I'm afraid. Um, but the, the interesting thing about AI is that really we should call it machine learning. Yes. AI is a different thing. We haven't actually got to much of that yet. It's machine learning, and machine learning is looking at lots and lots of data and finding patterns that aren't intuitive, that aren't obvious without a machine learning system, and then trying to create responses based on that. And it, it would be very interesting if we said to a machine learning system, what should we do about climate change, um, if we trusted it enough to actually take its results seriously. Because I, I think it would be revolutionary if we, if we did accept that we were now in a position where our own intuition was not sufficiently evolved to deal with this very complex and big problem and that we needed that kind of help. I'd like to see the results of that. Um, what, what I think is happening now is that we're moving into a sort of non-intuitive phase of our history. The complexity that we're dealing with is so, so rich. And uh, as, as any of you who know about chaos theory will understand, the number of outcomes, the number of possible outcomes is so large that we need help in dealing with this. We can get that help by crowdsourcing, by trusting each other's opinions and amassing them and looking at how well the data is being digested. But we could also do it, I think, somewhat with machine learning. I'm alone among my friends in this, because most of them deeply distrust it, but I'm alone among my friends in also thinking that we should be now looking at nuclear power as a serious... Um, we, we were talking earlier to, about, you were mentioning lignite, the Germans using lignite. Why are the Germans using lignite, the dirtiest fuel on the planet? Because, the, unfortunately, the German Greens persuaded them to shut down their nuclear power stations. Ah, it wasn't a good German Greens. Angela Merkel deciding like that after Fukushima, Fukushima that she would get more votes if she shut them down. Yeah, maybe. The Greens had no influence. Yeah. <laughs> it was they, Angela Merkel's they were typical, very happy, they were so you happy know, to support her. Um, opportunism. Yeah, but they were happy to support look, it. I, look, remember, we were having a chat uh, backstage beforehand, and uh, we said that we were asked, do you disagree on anything? And we couldn't find anything to disagree. Here, we found something to disagree on. I'm against <laughs> nuclear power. And you know why? Not just because of 
you know, the fact that we don't know what to do with nuclear waste. But primarily, cost. It really, now, I mean, you're right, 10 years ago, when Merkel made that choice, it was a mistake from a climate change perspective. But now, to start designing and building new nuclear power stations, irrelevant. The cost and efficiency of wind and solar um, has become so wonderful. I mean, let me give you an Are you aware of the, the land area involved to, tr to try to replace coal power? It's, it's not a question. I thoroughly oh, no, no, agree no, no. with now, you. I would, now, now we, I would live we in have a renewable the capacity, world. The capacity to have floating solar panels and wind turbines that will produce 100% of energy within the next five years around the world. This is, this is now clearly feasible with existing technology, not with your we have to We have to look at the arithmetic of this. Yeah, yeah we've, we've looked at it. <laughs> I mean, people have looked at the arithmetic. Okay, look, we are disagreeing on something. Um, <laughs> but let, let, let me go to the, to the key question mm. about um, AI and the singularity moment mm. that people talk about. That there will come a moment very soon, maybe six months to two years, when the number of jobs created by the new technology is going to be far, far less than the number of jobs that will be destroyed because you know, every technological innovation destroys jobs. But up until now, it has been creating more jobs than it has been destroying. And now the singularity moment is when AI will destroy 45% you know, of professions all in one year or two.